Selamat pagi teman-teman semuanya di Indonesia. Ya, selamat pagi. Bu Nuning udah ada, Bu Dini udah ada. Oke, Prof. Oke, Prof, mungkin bisa kita mulai sekarang ya karena berhubung Prof Ryan sudah datang. Iya. Oke, okay, uh, once again I would like to greet uh, good morning Prof Ryan uh, good morning. from as the coordinator of One Health Collaborating Center. Uh, Dr. Dini Wahyu Kartika Sari, SPI MSI, as the head of master study program for biotechnology, a postgraduate school UGM. Good morning, uh, Dr. Dini. And then uh, I would like to greet also Dr. Tririni Nuriring Tias, SSI MSC, the head of doctor's uh, study program for biotechnology, postgraduate school, Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, good morning, Dr. Nuriring Tias. Morning. And also, I would like to uh, greet the honorable of our speakers today, uh, Prof. Teruna from the University of Kansas. Good evening, I think, there. Yes, good, good morning. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much for joining with us, even though there is a little bit late there. Yeah, thank that's very much. eight o'clock. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Prof. And also, um, Uh, Prof. Siti Subandia, good morning, Prof. Selamat pagi. Ya, yeah, uh, selamat pagi. And good morning also for all of the participants. Uh, we use English today because uh, we received several participants from the Philippines. I think this is come from Pununing uh, ah, College okay. or not? <laughs> because from UBLB. Yeah, I, I think maybe okay. because I just saw some of them is from the Philippines. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for all of the participants joining with uh, us in today's learning session and the lecture se series, I mean. Before we start this morning uh, session, I would like to invite two important people to give up an opening speech, just a short opening speech. First, I would like to invite Prof. Ayan. Good morning, Prof. Ayan. Hello, good morning. Yeah. This hello, good yours. morning. Yeah, well, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, this thing is guest, Prof. Taruna from KU, from Kansas University. Uh, on behalf of uh, One Health Collaborating Center, I would like to thank for your participation. This is the first uh, lecture series in our uh, institution. And also, Honorable uh, Prof. Bagus Wahyono, the friend of uh, Prof. Taruna in Tucson. Uh, uh, but now he is a uh, chairperson uh, in the uh, why, uh, why, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the very important person in Gajah Mada University and, and uh, Prof Dia as a uh, second speaker for today I would like to thanks also for uh, uh, activities and uh, participation on this uh, first lecture session So for all of you, I would like to thank for your participation and, and hopefully we still have uh, many others uh, lectures, series, maybe in uh, two months, maybe Dr. Dini and Dr. Nuning will explain later on. But we still have for this series session uh, in September, uh, One Health and uh, Zoonotic Diseases. And today is a plenary uh, session from uh, Prof. Taruna. I would like to thank again all of you. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semuanya. Saya kira itu yang bisa saya sampaikan. Uh, Mudah-mudahan apa yang kita lakukan hari ini bisa menambah ilmu pengetahuan dan juga sharing uh, sharing. Uh, Sayan dengan teman-teman dengan uh, Prof Taruna dari KU. Beliau adalah sebagai tokoh Indonesia yang ada di US sebagai diaspora. Saya kira sangat baik untuk menularkan ilmunya kepada kita semuanya. Uh, beliau adalah sebagai uh, Global Health juga di sana sebagai Direktur Global Health di Kansas University. Uh, I think that's I want to say about everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, have a nice discussion. Uh, have a nice lecture from both a very important person for today. Okay, thank you. Thank Putu. you, Prof. Ayan. 
Thank you, Prof. Ayan. Next, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to give the screen to Dr. Dini to give the opening speech. Dr. Dini, good morning. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah, you, Mbak. You're Peter. welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome you, all of you, to the Biotech Seminar Series. So we will, uh, actually, we will have uh, several uh, webinar series, uh, maybe two, up to four each semester. So in this first biotech seminar series, biotech uh, One Health Collaborative Center in collaboration with a biotechnology study program and a biotechnology research center. Uh, please welcome to our speakers, Prof. Erina Siahaan from Kansas University, who will talk trend in modern biotech health, biotechnology, and also our second speakers, uh, Prof. Siti Subandia from Biotechnology Research Center, who will talk the role of biotechnology for global food security. So ladies and gentlemen, we all understand the importance of biotechnology in our day-to-day -day lives and the way which they are transforming the world. I believe that uh, by participating in this webinar, we are on the right place and on the right time. So together, let us accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up of good practices. So I wish you all, all of you, a very success, successful webinar and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dini. So now we move to the next session, the main session of this morning and without any further ado, I would like to introduce you, our beloved moderator, who will uh, lead the discussion in this morning. So, this is our wait a minute, yeah, this is our morning moderator, Dr. Tririni Nuriring Tias, SSIMSC. I think all of us already know who is who is she. Uh, she is the head of doctorate study program for biotechnology, postgraduate program, Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Biology, Universitas Gajah Mada, and Research Center for Biotechnology, Universitas Gajah Mada. She got her master's degree in molecular biology and biotechnology, University of the Philippines at Los Panos, the, Fili uh, the, the Philippines. She finished her doctoral degree in plant ecology and phytochemistry in Institute Biology, Leiden, Leiden University, the Netherlands. She has published more than 30 international journals and seven national journals about cancer, secondary metabolite products, and many more. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nuning. I, I usually greet her with that name. <laughs> Good morning, okay. doctor. Good morning, uh, Buto. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Yes, you're welcome. Now the screen is yours. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's, uh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. Let me check here. So, it's my, uh, it's a pleasure that today we will have a very Great. Uh, we already have two excellent uh, speakers. Yeah. Good morning, Prof. Siti Subandia, and good evening, Prof. Daruna. Yeah. Uh, so I think I will not really um, uh, take take a lot of time here. So I just like to welcome uh, the two speakers and also, um, actually, as mentioned by uh, Budini, uh, Dr. Dini already, that this is the first uh, biotechnology lectures. Uh, and of course, we are very lucky that both speaker today will deliver about how biotechnology promote uh, One Health. But before we listen to the lecture, so I would like to read uh, the housekeeping first, maybe. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think we, I have to uh, deal with the housekeeping item first. So, so all of the uh, participants today will understand what should do and then how we, we if there is some uh, question will be raised. Yeah. So first here. Uh, the participant may ask the speakers during the course, of course, yeah, through the uh, pigeon hole, yeah, to the uh, One Health, there, there will be a link there, yeah, for this, for this, and then password is One Health. So you can write your uh, question later there. And then other issue may be asked in the chat room as well. And then 
uh, the, all of the participants will get the A certificate yeah, and will be shared a week after the lecture and the speaker materials will be shared with the speaker's permission later. Uh, the link for attendance will be shared uh, 10 minutes prior to the end of today's uh, lecture, okay? So I hope everyone is already understand how, how we will do this and um, I will uh, we will start first later with Prof. Taruna, and then he will give a lecture around 40 minutes, Prof. And then directly we will go to the question and answer session for 15 minutes. Then after that, we will go to the second spe our spe second speaker, Prof. Siti Supendia, with the same time allocation. Yeah. So um, I would like first to uh, read the curriculum vitae of Prof. Taruna uh, As mentioned here that he is a department of pharmaceutical chemistry and the University of Kansas. And Prof. Taruna Siahaan earned a BS and MS from the University of Indonesia and then the PhD from the University of Arizona. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And then currently he is a professor and associate chair of the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, the University of Kansas. Uh, Prof. Siahaan's research interests are in the utilization and modulation of cell addition molecules on the cell surface for targeted drug delivery to a specific cell type and for enhancing drug permission through the intestinal mucosa and blood brain barrier. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, we are really lucky today that we will have, uh, we will learn uh, from him and uh, we really appreciate and thanks to Prof. Taruna uh, for your kind support to this program. So uh, I will just like, um, and yeah, if you will, if we also we check in the internet actually, so we will see that Prof. Taruna has already published more than 100 uh, publication and also even the high index very high. So I'm, I'm sure that today uh, everyone is already not, um, cannot wait anymore yeah, to listen to his lecture. So uh, without further ado, so Prof. Siahaan, uh, please, uh, time is yours. Uh, you can uh, start your uh, lecture. Thank you for the nice introduction. Everybody can hear me, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay, just a second. And I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, <coughs> just a second. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Everybody see my? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's clear. Yes. Okay. Just a second. Pointer. Okay. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to give this lecture, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, what I'm going to do today is uh, give a big overview because the topic is uh, promoting one health in biotechnology. And then I uh, focus this talk to therapeutics, uh, therapeutic biotechnology, because that's my strength. So I'm going to talk about basically uh, new type of drugs different than uh, what we used to uh, see uh, like uh, small molecule drugs. Just uh, for introduction, I'm from the University of, the University of Kansas, and uh, we usually call them KU, Kansas University. We have a beautiful campus. We are right in the center of the United States here. And uh, our school of pharmacy here, uh, the top three to five, depending on years in the US. And this is our, our mascot. It's a fictitious bird. We call it Jayhawk. It's, there is no Jayhawk in the world, but but this is fictitious bird. Uh, we are famous with basketball because the inventor of basketball, uh, Dr. James Nightsmith, he invented basketball in uh, KU. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, how people develop drugs uh, and then what kind of things that are uh, important because uh, as you know, uh, you probably in Indonesia, 
uh, interested in also uh, in drug discovery and development. So, um, so we got this final drug product, but there are many things that we need to do. First, we need to discover the molecules. So in the old days, we would look at small molecules, we screen natural products. But now, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, biotechnology project like protein, enzymes, antibodies become drugs. And also there's a lot of work in peptides, which is small molecules, uh, you know, smaller section of a protein. So there are uh, many people involved, obviously chemists, biologists, and, and pharmacologists involved in this um, endeavor. So, and not only that, if you discover API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, you need uh, to develop them. So you cannot have just potent molecule and then become a drug. And um, can, can somebody mute uh, the attendance because it's kind of, okay. Uh, so, and we need to have a development section. Uh, people has to formulate and deliver the molecule. And this also involves chemistry and biology, pharmacology, and so forth. So uh, in order to develop this drug, there's a complex and long, long-winded process and also could be expensive. So normally, if we are in the university, we discover a molecule, we put it into certain stage, maybe we spin off a small company, and then after that, we have to get a partner. So university cannot develop a drug usually. So because there's a lot of uh, funding involved. Uh, so uh, in the old days, we are looking at small molecules, but now drugs becomes bigger and bigger, the size. And because it's getting bigger, it becomes more complex. So we start with small molecules and then we begin to look at peptides. And then nowadays, actually proteins is first before peptides, okay? So we got enzymes becomes drug and then also antibody. Antibodies nowadays is really popular because of its you know, special properties. And then um, from antibody people uh, de develop what we call it antibody drug conjugates. What does that mean? It means you conjugate small drug to antibodies or peptides to antibodies. Uh, why do they do that? Because they wanna make the drug has low side effects. The reason is because the antibody is very specific. So the antibody can target specific receptor on the surface of cells. So there is no off target of the small molecule. So that's become uh, the last 10 years uh, becomes really popular. So the way I give this talk is not so detailed, but uh, an overview. And uh, genes becomes drug like siRNA. And then obviously we, we know about vaccines. So all this uh, uh, development is uh, becomes a molecule or a treatment of the future. So the biotechnology area becomes booming in US more so probably later in Indonesia. So uh, people move on to a further more complex system, which is a uh, new therapy, they call it um, cell therapy. So uh, just like CAR T cell. So in this case, if you have a, a cancer, for example, uh, and then the doctor will isolate your T cell and then uh, insert a, a gene into it. And uh, we call it chimeric antigen receptor. So what happens is this molecule, oh, I'm sorry, this cell now will recognize the antigen maybe on uh, the cancer. And then after that, you produce a lot of them outside and uh, then they inject it back into the patient because they have this antigen recognition site, then the, can the T cell will kill the tumor cell. So this is a very selective method uh, of uh, killing uh, cancer. So it's very specific, although this is uh, kind of a little bit expensive because uh, this process is cumbersome, but, uh, the advantage that I've seen so far is that uh, people who are not responding to uh, normal uh, chemotherapy now 
they can uh, respond to this treatment. So there is uh, uh, there is future for this type of work. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, protein therapeutics. Uh, so here is that um, as you can see, uh, early in 1982, only about two molecules uh, as a protein drug. One of them, uh, insulin. So and then. And then as time goes by, more and more molecules, uh, protein molecules become drugs. And then as you can see nowadays is, is so many of these drugs on the market. And even in that time, uh, if you have uh, nine, uh, nine drugs, for example, but there are many indications because sometimes uh, this one drug or one protein can treat uh, many, many diseases or many indications. So, so first they got to prove it, one disease, and then, then because they know that that molecule, that protein has certain mechanism that can, can modulate other diseases, and then they try to the other indication or other disease. So then that's why you get more indications than, than the number of molecules. So, so uh, the sale of Antibody, for example, it's quite huge here because they are pretty specific, and although the because the development is very difficult uh, and the drug itself become expensive, but normally the antibody drugs uh, has less side effect because they have a high, very high specificity. Okay, so uh, this is uh, I'm going to show you. Um, uh, type of uh, drugs that uh, that protein, um, I'm sorry, type of protein drugs that uh, on the market, um, majority of monoclonal antibody. The reason is monoclonal antibody is very uh, specific and then also very potent. So uh, the other thing is they're quite stable in the bloodstream compared to other molecules. And lots of uh, a plasma protein growth factors, and then also enzyme and coagulation factors. Some of these coagulation factors is for people who has problem with uh, their blood cannot clot. So they have problem with bleeding. So they, they are treated with this coagulation factor. Now, uh, nowadays, uh, peptides also become drugs. So the number of peptides that become drugs increasing uh, uh, tremendously because I remember when I was working in the pharmaceutical industry in 1989 to 1991, not many peptides become drugs. And in fact, when we are working in, in a peptide group, uh, people in the small molecule group thinks that uh, our work is useless. Uh, nothing's going to be a uh, drugs. But now, as you can see, by 2015, there are uh, about uh, almost 70 drugs on the market, okay? So peptides now also uh, can become drugs. I, I'm involved directly with this, this uh, peptide called RGD. Why do they call RGD? It's because it has arginine, glycine, uh, aspartic acid. Uh, this is a cell adhesion peptide and this peptides become a drug uh, called integralin. This drug, uh, uh, they use this drug for antithrombic agents. So if you have a blood clotting, for example, in your artery, and then first you got treated with TPA, but TPA can be used many, many times. So in the future, if you have problem again, you have to find an alternative. So this is one of the alternative for uh, antithrombic agent. Now, from peptide, people becomes uh, able to develop what we call it uh, peptidomimetics. This is a product by Merck. They uh, call it Agrostat. So that's this only also antithrombic agent. Now this is the oldest drug that we know, which is oxytocin. Oxytocin uh, is a cyclic peptide, and they use this to induce labor. So if if a uh, 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 mother need to be induced their labor, so you use oxytocin. And nowadays, recently, octreotide, this is a peptide, also cyclic peptide. Uh, it is an anti-tumor uh, agent. So there are many, many drugs now uh, in the market. And then uh, 
peptidomimetics also a lot in, in the market now. This is usually when they call it peptidomimetics, it's, it means they derive from peptide, but they change some of the bond becomes mimetics. So this is uh, for hypertension. And then also uh, there are lots of drug uh, as antiviral uh, agent like uh, anti -H, uh, HIV protease inhibitor, okay. So I'm gonna talk about a little, a little bit about uh, to design uh, uh, inhibitors. Uh, so from optimal substrate. So usually the, if I go back here, uh, some of these drugs here come from peptides and then they change it to inhibitor. So it's actually, if you look at this, it looks like a peptide, but uh, originally they are substrate for an enzyme and then they convert it to inhibitor. So I have uh, involvement with this when I was in, in the in the company, and then now also working with this um, uh, in at KU. So if you look at HIV, uh, HIV uh, enter the cell and then dump its its uh, its content, and then express the protein, uh, and then the the protein that get expressed uh, it's clipped by what we call it HIV protease. So the goal of the HIV protease is to clip the pro protein, then so it will assemble to the virus so the virus can replicate. So what happens is in this case, um, they design a peptide or peptidomimetic that can bind to HIV protease enzyme. So the HIV protease cannot work. So after that, and the virus cannot replicate. So that's the mechanism of a lot of uh, HIV protease uh, inhibitor uh, drugs that you have on, on the market currently. So what they did is they, uh, they have this uh, aspartic protease and then the pro HIV protease got processed to mature uh, HIV uh, protease. And then, and then this HIV protease clipped the GAC pole uh, polyprotein and then uh, it clip in nine sites and it replicates. So if you block this process here, the virus cannot replicate. That's the reason you got uh, anti-viral uh, agent HIV protease inhibitor. Okay, so the idea is the following. So if you have a substrate, it means a peptide. This is the uh, peptide. It has like, uh, and then the enzyme cut here, so we call it usually here is P1 prime, uh, P1, I'm sorry, to the left is P1, and then it binds to S1 of the enzyme, and then P2 bind to S2 and so forth. And then I'll talk about this a little bit later again. And then um, and then you can see that the to the right of the clippage site here, which is the peptide bond, you got uh, S1 prime uh, P2, prime bind to S2 and, and so forth. So uh, what they did when they designed the HIV protease uh, inhibitor is that by they are optimizing the substrate. So the substrate clip faster, bind uh, really nicely uh, to the enzyme. And then uh, after that, they fool the enzyme by changing this peptide bond to this uh, bond, we call it bioisosteer. So as you can see, the molecule here binds to the enzyme tightly because we already know uh, what the side chain of the substrate uh, bind to, or we already optimized them. Therefore, uh, this molecule, when they bind to the enzyme, the active side, active side of the enzyme cannot clip this bond. So the enzyme stop working. So they become inhibitors. So from this type of work, uh, people design uh, many what we call it bioisosteer. Uh, this is kind of like transition state mimic uh, bioisosteer. So they got develop all these different ones, and then from this uh, they develop uh, HIV protease inhibitor. So you you can see here this is the substrate, the peptide substrate. They clip here, and then they start changing this peptide bond. And then when they change that to this type of bond, now they can the enzyme cannot clip it. And then at the end of the day, they got this 
uh, antiviral agent called ritonavir. Okay, so so also from this type of modification, also they found indinavir. So this is now uh, HIV protease that you can see in the market. So after that, there's many companies developing many many other HIV protease inhibitor. So my lab, uh, when I was at Sterling, we developed a library of peptides. We developed like 24,000 peptide library. So when COVID came, uh, actually that library, uh, they give the library to me because the company was sold to another company and then they give the library to me. So we developed, uh, we, I'm sorry, we, we studied the library and with other enzyme. But when COVID comes, uh, I become interested in looking at how COVID replicate. So if, as you can see, uh, they usually enter by budding to the ACE uh, receptor, and then they got uptake. And there's an enzyme here that you can block actually. And uh, what I'm interested, oops, sorry. What I'm interested in is similar to the HIV protease, uh, when they make this uh, polyprotein uh, chain, there is what they call it EMPRO enzyme. So the EMPRO enzyme will clip uh, the the poly uh, polyprotein uh, polypeptide chain to become uh, fragments that can uh, that can ensemble to make the virus. So if you block the EMPRO enzyme, you can block the replication of COVID nineteen. So um, people use this mixture of lip. Uh, lopinavir and ritonavir, this is HIV protease uh, inhibitor to block EMPRO. Uh, they see some efficacy, but the dose is too high. Therefore, when they translate it to human, there's lots of uh, side effect, I think, so they cannot use it. So what we are thinking, maybe we use uh, our library also to, uh, to develop this, uh, um, this inhibitor. So here we got this EMPRO uh, enzyme and then we can express them. The, re the reason they work because uh, how they work, I'm sorry, EMPRO enzyme will digest this 11 uh, uh, viral protein, viral polyprotein uh, that form that assemble to a virus. So we express that protein and then try to see if we can screen our peptide library. Okay, similar to HIV protease uh, in the old days, in about 30 years ago. So uh, this is the library that we have. Uh, this is I developed a long time ago when I was in the company and then I inherited it uh, from them. So what, what we did, we synthesized uh, peptide um, in the glass beads and then we have these different libraries, uh, uh, volumes of peptides. And here, as you notice, there's a COP group, is this coumarin group. So if the enzyme clip here, the solutions become uh, fluoresce. So this is one example of our, our beads. Um, and then we have, a, we have to, uh, three different volumes. Basically, these three volumes contain uh, 24,000 peptides. This is a, a table that we use to see what peptide it is that we're working on. Okay. And uh, this is very recent data. Uh, as, as you can see here, we have uh, this peptide here uh, has AAA. The XI uh, will have 20 amino acid uh, differences, a single amino acid, but we mutate them 20 times. The XJ also, uh, we mutate them 20 times, but we recently only have, uh, we almost finished uh, one series of this. And here, as you can see, uh, as you change the XJ here, you can see we find, we find a, a, one of the best substrates so far. It is interesting that uh, the um, XI is supposed to be Q, okay? And then the XJ, we change with 20 amino acid. When we look at literature, 
the uh, best XJ so far is uh, serine, alanine, and glycine. As you can see, they are not as good sub substrate as what we found K in the XJ position and P in the XJ position. So we hope that uh, with this library, we can find new substrate uh, better than what we have in the literature, and then we can convert them to inhibitor so we can inhibit MPRO enzyme. Well, we have a collaboration with uh, uh, a colleague in K-State. Uh, they have a model of uh, COVID in vitro and in hamster model for in vivo. So when we design uh, the uh, inhibitor, they will test it for us because they have a, a BSL-3 facility at K-State. We don't, we have here, but it's, um, they have a better facility than us. Okay, so, so what we are trying to do is try to find uh, the best substrate using our library, okay? And then we're gonna convert our, li uh, our best substrate to become an uh, inhibitor by changing just one peptide bond. Of course, later on, we, we will play around changing the other part because in order to develop the drug, right? Uh, activity is not enough, right? So, because the, the drug also has to be, uh, uh, has to have a properties that can penetrate the cell membrane because the target, the enzyme is inside the cell. So we have also to uh, have to play with the physical chemical properties of the peptidomimetic before it can be a drug. So. So that's gonna be a long, long way away still. Okay, so that's that's one area that that's a really, really uh, uh, a little bit uh, advanced, you know, from from peptide to peptidomimetics. Now I'm gonna talk to you about uh, peptide or protein uh, drug conjugates. So this is really cutting edge uh, science because. Uh, lots of side effects can be lowered by uh, making this type of conjugates. Okay, so what is a drug conjugate? A drug conjugate is actually consists of three uh, different uh, portions. So one portion is uh, either peptide or uh, protein or antibody. The goal of this uh, peptide or antibody is to direct the drug to specific cell, not to every cell. Because uh, in the old days, we deliver drug, toxic drug, anti-cancer drug, they'll go everywhere. So the off-target is high. But nowadays to lower the side effect, they make this what we call it antibody drug conjugate or drug conjugates, peptide drug conjugates. So we have this this antibody that can specifically like target uh, target the cancer cell, and then we have a linker. The linker, the goal of the linker to get uh, there are many role of it to make it far away from the the targeting molecules, but also to control it so you can release the drug at the appropriate time. So this is just like a, a payload, and this is uh, the guided system okay so so i already and i already told you that the the goal is for uh, lowering the side effect okay so there are uh things that you uh look at to conjugate your drug to the antibody sometimes uh, they use the thiol group the carboxylic acid or the amine group the most popular one is the lysine uh, group because if you have antibody, you have many, many lysines and uh, then you can conjugate your molecule. Now, if you used to work with small molecule, when you work with small molecule, you say it has to be one entity, it has to be pure. But when you work with conjugate, you will work with mixture because what happens is you've got 100 lysines maybe 50 of them got con and out of the 50 maybe um, uh, maybe the middle part only uh, 
the highest population may be a three or four uh, conjugation, and then it's random in all these 50 lysines. So, so the product is a mixture, but yet uh, it's been proven that it's work. So as long as, uh, as long as you, you are producing a similar product as the one that you use in clinical trial, you are okay. So, so this the technology here is is uh, is really important to control uh, your product. We call it API, you know, active pharmaceutical ingredient. Okay. Okay. So why uh, people use this and it's proven uh, uh, effective? Because normally you got antigen or protein receptor on the cell surface, and then you target your antibody into uh, into this uh, onto the the antigen or onto the receptor, and then the cell will undergo receptor mediated endocytosis to endosome, and then as soon as uh, the endosome goes to lysosome, the pH change, and there's a lot of enzyme there, and then uh, the linker will be clipped here. So if this is a tumor cell, now the, an the anti-cancer drug will uh, go to its target inside the cell to kill the cell. So because the drug conjugated to the antibody, therefore, if the antibody doesn't target any cell, the normal cell, then the normal cell is not gonna be killed by the drug. That's the reason uh, the antibody drug conjugate has lower side effect, okay. Okay, so there's a lot of work on this and then now there's a lot of, uh, a lot of antibody that targeted to her antigen because her two has been known to be expressed in tumor cell and there's a lot of antibody drug conjugate that's been successful and been used uh, on the market uh, to target her two receptor. And people have been conjugating antibodies to many different things for different purposes. Uh, it could be radioimmunoconjugate, it could be for targeting cytokines and many, many other things. So, so I'm in US, uh, usually there's so many of this uh, research happening. And as far as I know, uh, not many in Indonesia. So I think this is a good way to go uh, and a lot more uh, specific and a lot more safe. So for example, if you discover um, uh, uh, natural products that that is uh, uh, good for cancer, but it's toxic. So the toxicity is so high. And this is one way to go to, uh, to lower the tox to the lower the side effect, the toxicity, so it can target tumor or whatever it is that you are targeting. So this is the uh, drug that on the market, the first drug uh, conjugate on the market is Mylotark. Uh, it conjugate to this uh, calicomycin. This is very, very toxic. Uh, at the beginning, um, after a couple of years, this drug got withdrawn on the market from the market but later on they figure out what happens and then they, they use it again now. And then um, they have new drugs now, which is uh, Katsaikla. And then uh, this is conjugated with this, this molecule here. And this is a drug on the market. It's approved uh, in 2013, okay. Okay, so how do people uh, conjugate them? It's a, normally they use very simple chemistry. Uh, they use uh, uh, this type of chain and it has X and Y here, either oxygen or nitrogen. As I can, I would, as I told you before, we use lysine. Sometimes they use a polyethylene glycol as a linker. And then uh, they use uh, anhydride to conjugate to the uh, lysine side chain of, of the antibody or the protein. Okay, I'm gonna go fast here because, okay. 
Uh, the other thing that's important is uh, to ask question, where do you conjugate uh, the drug? This is quite important because you don't want to conjugate the drug to the antibody to the site where the drug is active. So you want to find a place uh, to conjugate them. And the other things that people use, usually the conjugation site can be labile because you want to release the drug from the antibody. So this is another anti-cancer drug. There are many sites that you can conjugate it, but the best site is this site here by conjugate it to the, to the ketone here, or you modify the R, uh, you conjugate it to this site here. Uh, if you conjugate it to the amine group here, what happens is uh, this amine group is important for activity. If you have something going on, um, any groups that hanging here, the activity might be not as good as uh, the original drug. Okay, and uh, we work with methotrexate, the same thing here. Uh, if you conjugate it here, uh, they are not active to inhibit uh, enzyme called DHFR, but you have to conjugate it in the other side here. Okay. And campotecan, people conjugate it to the alcohol. Okay. What kind of chemistry people use? There are many different chemistry uh, that people use uh, to conjugate doxorubicin if you want to conjugate to the amine groups. And, and this is uh, well studied and people have done many, many study here to conjugate peptides uh, to doxorubicin. Okay, here usually they use uh, amine groups and then, and then conjugate them uh, to doxorubicin that way. Okay, so um, once you have your conjugate and uh, you want to study them in, uh, in vivo, obviously, uh, first in vitro and then in vivo. So I'm going to move a little bit towards um, conjugates for uh, autoimmune diseases. This is, uh, I'm showing you our work here at, at KU. So. When I started at KU, we are looking at cell antigen molecule because that's what my interest is. Apparently cell antigen molecule is really important for uh, T cell uh, proliferation and activation. So if you have uh, antigen presenting cell and you're presenting antigen uh, to the surface, and then the T cell will uh, use its TCR, T cell receptor to recognize the antigen. And then there's a molecule called LFA and ICAM that interact. This is what we call it signal two molecule. So if this happened, uh, there's a clonal expansion. This is similar to vaccination. For example, if you vaccinate somebody with certain uh, protein and then uh, the antigen presenting cell will uh, present the protein and it will activate uh, the T cell and, and you have clonal expansion then you generate the uh, host immune response. But this process is not good if, if it's uh, in autoimmune diseases because somehow uh, your T cell recognize protein from your body, therefore it will attack your body, okay? So in autoimmune diseases, what happens is if you get act activation of T cell and attack your body, we found that if you block this uh, ICAM LFA signal or signal two, therefore this T cell becomes uh, what we call it uh, energy or induced cell death. So, so at that time uh, we got supported by a Japanese company. They want to find peptides that can block this process. So uh, we look at the ICAM molecules and then we, to make a long story short, we, we found two peptides that can block the T cell adhesion. And then from uh, that long peptide, we make cyclic peptides. Why we make cyclic peptide? Cyclic peptide usually uh, very stable in the blood, more so than the linear peptide. And also by forming cyclic peptide, you have more uh, higher selectivity or specificity to the receptor. So um, we found this, uh, we found this 
CIBR peptide better than the other peptides. So we study the CIBR peptide. So this peptide will bind to a receptor on the surface of T cell called, uh, called uh, integrin, I'm sorry, LFA, I'm sorry. So uh, what we did before, uh, what to our surprise actually, when we tried to study the binding of this peptide to T cell, we thought, the peptide only bind on the surface, okay? And uh, so what happens is we label them with uh, FITC or fluorescent label. So what happens is uh, we prove that the peptide bind to the surface. The reason is we incubate the T cell with the peptide um, and the peptide has uh, uh, FITC, like the green fluorescence. And then we incubate the cell also with an antibody with a, a PE uh, dye. And then as you can see, the red here is uh, the LFA they get labeled by the antibody. The green is the LFA, uh, the alpha subunit got labeled by the um, the peptide. Uh, all the yellow, it means the two molecules in the same place. This is the proof uh, for us that our peptide bind to the recept target receptor that we uh, hope to bind to, okay? And we also did express the protein, the, uh, the, the receptor protein, only part of it, the I domain, and the peptide, we see the peptide bind Using NMR, we can determine the peptide bind to the I domain of the LFA, what we call it the I DAS domain. Okay. So, what's surprising to us is that not only it binds to the receptor, when we add the FITC CIBR, the label peptide, you can see they got internalized by the T cell. And we also use FITC dextran as a control. And then if you lower uh, the temperature, these peptide didn't get in. So this, this is uh, saying to us that the peptide bind to the receptor, not only on the surface, but the receptor engulf the peptide into the cell. So because of this, we have uh, idea, right? The idea is the following. Uh, if our peptide bind to the cell and then we activate the cell and the, the cell can engulf the molecule, therefore the peptide can be conjugated to the drug, maybe we'll kill the activated uh, T cell. Why do we wanna kill the activated T cell? Because, because uh, in the case of um, uh, autoimmune diseases, you have this, uh, inflammatory condition where the T cell got activated, try to attack your own cell bodies, you know, like in arthritis or in MS. So if you deliver the peptide, the activated T cell will engulf them and, and kill themselves. So that's, that's the idea here. Okay, I have, I think, only a couple of minutes, right? So, so what we did, uh, we conjugate, uh, right? I have only two minutes, is that right? Uh, still five minutes. Both. Five minutes, good, yeah, five minutes, okay. All right, I'll, five minutes, thank you. So, so, and then we conjugate a drug called metrotrexate. So metrotrexate, actually, they use it as anti-arthritic drug, and also they use it as anti-cancer drug, but it has side effect, usually. So we thought maybe we can uh, prove the concept. So we conjugate the metrotexate to the MTX. As I told you before, you need to conjugate the MTX to the uh, to gamma carboxylic acid, not the alpha carboxylic acid. So we synthesize it by uh, starting with pteridine and then protecting this um, this glutamic acid uh, alpha, and then we conjugate it to the gamma carboxylic acid and then conjugate it to the peptide. So we, we conjugate the peptide to the MTX metrotextin. Okay. 
Okay, and then the uh, question is, is that, uh, can this conjugate inhibit um, arthritis? So we have this arthritis model, adjuvant model. And as you can see, uh, with normal vehicle, and then you got uh, um, the arthritis score here. And then as you increase the dose of the conjugate, you can suppress uh, the, the arthritis. And then you can see here uh, the joint. Here is the normal joint, as you can see, a really nice joint. And then uh, this is the arthritic models, uh, arthritic mice, I'm sorry. You can see the damage in the joint. And then this is the treated uh, animal with MTXCIBR. And the other thing that's uh, good in this study that that usually metrotexate is pretty toxic. Although you can see the animal get, uh, uh, the arthritis is suppressed, but the animal gets sick because of toxicity. With our conjugate, usually uh, they are not toxic. So that's one area that we're working on, uh, on conjugate, peptide conjugate. Uh, we have another area where uh, we are trying to deliver peptides to antigen presenting cell to control autoimmune diseases. In this case, we have this big molecule called I-domain. I-domain bind to ICAM on the surface of uh, antigen presenting cell. Then we conjugate this molecule to, uh, to peptides that are known to suppress uh, MS. Uh, and in this study, we inject the conjugate to the MS mice, and we can see that they can suppress uh, MS. Uh, this is actually MS score. What it is is like uh, you induce the disease, uh, the animal get paralyzed, and then they recover, which is remission, and then go back up again. Here we inject uh, the IDAC molecule. It can suppress the disease. The beauty here is that uh, the two molecule that we designed, this is peptide conjugate, this is protein peptide conjugate. We inject this as a vaccine-like. It means that we inject them when they are healthy at, at day minus, ele eight and, uh, minus 11 and minus eight. Here is three times. And then we stimulate the disease and yet it still suppress the disease. It's just like a vaccine. So, so in the future, probably we if somebody uh, has, uh, has a tendency to get certain disease, we might be able to, especially autoimmune disease, we can treat them early before they get the disease. So this is one of the proof of concept that we got. Uh, and uh, later on, we also use FC to conjugate to our peptide to target uh, MS. The reason we use FC because FC has been shown to engulf by cell. Therefore, the peptide becomes more stable. And that's part of the reason antibody is a good drug because they got engulfed by cell. They got protected from the plasma enzyme. So here, our FC conjugate peptide also can suppress nicely uh, MS in animal model. OK, I might want to stop here. I have a lot, if I, if you let me talk, I can talk for two hours, <laughs> lots of data and stuff. Yeah. But, but I can show you that, that this is uh, the way of the future. Although this molecule is not approved yet, mm -hmm. but this type of idea uh, uh, been kicking around and many people are interested in doing this kind of thing. Uh, so since in uh, Gajamada, uh, interested in biotechnology, if you're mm -hmm. strong in protein expression, uh, this is a way to go, looking at target molecules or target disease that can, uh, can be uh, uh, investigated, I guess, and then has your own product. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, actually, we, uh, we are going to have MOU with uh, University of Gajamada. Oh. I think it's already signed. And then uh, our chancellor is just signing it right now. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, I have plenty of stuff, but, but you can ask me anything. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Taruna. It's oh, uh, I even quite uh, already forget with the time because I really enjoy your lectures. Yeah. It's a really good uh, insight for us, especially for with this advancement, the cutting edge uh, for drug development, which really. I think it's new and it's really not really uh, familiar in Indonesia. So that's why it's really, really good insight for us. I believe it's very important for us all, for all of us. Okay, so let's go directly to the question and answer. I'm sure a lot of people is already have in mind uh, the, the question. So let's check with the pigeon hole. Okay. So let's uh, let me read this one question from Bapak Yudi Cahyono. Uh, regarding the, the, the CIBR for promoting T cell death, normally during autoimmune disease, not all T cells population are harmful. Does this the CIBR bound to all LVA expressing T cells, Prof. Taruna? Yeah. 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 So so theoretically. Uh, the activate they they bind bed they bind better to activated T cell. Mm. You're correct that that uh, in immune system you got this balance between inflammatory immune cell and regulatory, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't I didn't tell you about this. Uh, if you remember the last slide that I have, mm -hmm. the uh, IDAC molecule that we have I domain, uh -huh. and then we have uh, antigenic That's peptide. Right. Mm -hmm the actually the mechanism of that that molecule or the bpi molecule for that matter it can suppress ms uh, uh, and type 1 diabetes and uh, arthritis what what we found the mechanism is actually converting naive t cell from from naive t cell becomes a regulatory t cell it means you are balancing so in the same in the in the system of uh, uh, inflammatory system of autoimmune disease, essentially the molecule, there are two two jobs. One is to block proliferation the, of the activation activated inflammatory cell, and also it generate regulatory cell. Mm. So so the mechanism, uh, it's kind of complicated. Actually, I have the slide that I skipped. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the mechanism is 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 a bit complicated. I don't want to go through it. Yes, this is a, a good question. Yeah, the CIBR. Uh, um, we don't have data just CIBR alone to generate T Rec, mm -hmm. uh, but the the BPI, the conjugate with antigenic peptide, we have data to show that the IL ten goes up. Uh, the all inflammatory, the IFN gamma, in fact, especially TH17, which is inflammatory that target uh, autoimmune disease usually, they suppress when you inject them with the BPI molecule. So I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Taruna. How is that, Pak uh, Yudi? Is it uh, answering the, your question already? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go to the next uh, question. It is from Prof. Bagus. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the question is, in addition to my previous, uh, oh, this is already this is the second question, maybe. So maybe uh, Prof. Bagus has another uh, previous question. Uh, let's check it. Okay, this one, the first one here. Yeah, dear Prof. Taruna, thanks for the excellent lecture. What is consideration of changing big molecule to become a small active one, such as the prototype? To okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so essentially, so actually, that's that is what the CIBR is actually almost like making a big molecule mm -hmm. to a small molecule. So, so the story of CIBR actually, we got protein like ICAM, right? It has like a hundred amino acid each domain, so it has like five domain. But what we did, we identify is the domain one, the end terminal that far away from the cell is very important. From there, we at actually what we did was we study literature. Uh, this is just for students out there. Studying literature is really important. So you don't waste time a lot in the library. So we study literature and we found mutation. People mutate those, those 
those day one domain, when they mm -hmm. mutated, the receptor didn't bind. So mm -hmm. it means what we are saying at that mutation side is really important for binding. So what we did from that mutation side, we make peptides like 25 amino acid peptide. There are two, if you look at my slide before, there are two peptides that we found. And that peptide can block cell cell adhesion, T cell adhesion to another cell because they are in the same binding site as the protein. They are competing basically. So from that, we reduce it 12 amino acid. I didn't have, uh, we published this. If you search my publication, we reduce it to six amino acid. So like captofril, right? Only like almost like dipeptide, right? So, so you can actually, uh, the same thing, uh, uh, this question is also the same thing. If I, if you remember my first slide on RGD, they have RGD peptide, that antithrombic, it made out of like maybe it's about eight amino acid cyclic peptide. And then they make peptidomimetics from there, which is agrostat. So it's almost the same. So, so it's possible from the big protein to small peptide and to peptidomimetic, which is pretty small. So that's been proven in the, uh, in the literature, yeah. So then I think uh, there is a, a second question. Yeah. Uh, in addition to my previous question, when you have to stay with a big molecule as mentioned in your lecture of oxytocin, okay. Oh, okay, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, there, there are many ways to do this. Um, the problem a long time ago, people want to make peptidomimetic and small mm -hmm. because a lot of, in the old days, like when I was at Sterling, it's uh, people don't understand the formulation. Mm -hmm. People don't understand the stability of peptide and how to stabilize them. Mm -hmm. In fact, here at KU, the reason they recruit me here is to teach that course. I teach that for 30 years, how to improve stability of peptide, oh, okay. how to study them, uh, how to deliver them, how to formulate them. Nowadays, people know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Therefore, oxytocin in the old days, it's a natural product. But now, octreotide, is actually derived from, you know, um, a big protein, and then they make it smaller and smaller. They make it cyclic, and they know how to formulate it so it's stable enough to do its job. You don't need stable forever as small molecule. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the reason now peptides become booming uh, because antibody is good, but it's so expensive. Peptide you can synthesize. I can synthesize with peptide yeah. synthesizer in my lab. <laughs> that's the reason people uh, that's why I, it's, I'm surprised in Indonesia uh, not many people looking into peptides because, yeah, because you can synthesize it yourself and they are very important and they're very selective can be very selective yes. um, but, but now as you can see like my graph about mm -hmm. 70 peptides now on the market mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah it's really important okay thank you very much I uh, so, how is uh, Prof. Bagus? Is it uh, answering your question already? Yes, I think it's, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Truna. Welcome, Prof. Bagus. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, this is another question from Prof. Ayan, actually. So, uh, thank you, Prof. Truna, for your insight on drug delivery. Uh, in modern biotechnology, there are many new medical devices developed for tumor therapy, like cyber knife or airphone. Mm -hmm. Airphone, yeah, a non invasive method. Do we still need that? Or because of you, those uh, in fact, advancement yeah. in drug delivery? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think we still need many uh, armament uh, because yeah. uh, not one thing fits all. I think mm -hmm. uh, you can do mm -hmm. things in different ways. Uh, I don't think only one way to do things uh, because every little, every different things could have advantage and disadvantages. So, for example, like we cannot, for example, this is a very good example. Antibody cannot get into the brain, mm. right? So, uh, how do you, how you want to deliver them? That's another, another part of my research, how to deliver a big molecule to the yeah. brain. Yeah. But uh, some kind of, uh, you know, really incision, uh, like laser or, and radiations, you really still need it for brain tumor, for mm. example. Mm. 
mm -hmm. right? It's very difficult to, to treat it with chemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are many, many instances you have to use different things. So I don't think we should forget about <laughs> even all methods. Uh, yeah. Hopefully I answered that question. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prof. Taruna, for the answer. So how is that, Prof. Wayan? Ah, there is still one more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So need new drug for okay in case of the of dendritic cell used for mm -hmm. immunotherapy for COVID nineteen as developed by Dr. Terawan are possible to end the corona pandemic. What is your opinion? Yeah. It's, okay. It's okay. Very, yeah. So so I don't want to be political, <laughs> uh, but uh, but this is this is if you look at if you look at my slide right mm -hmm. there's a CAR T cell therapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. In the CAR T cell therapy, what happens is you isolate the T cell out and then you train them outside mm -hmm. and then you put them back in. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is uh, those process is quite expensive. It's not easy to do by individual. You have to do it in the in the uh, uh, in the really hospital setting. Mm. So. If that kind of therapy you want to do in mass produce, um, I don't know. This is just my opinion. It's not practical because it's actually that technology that they use is come derived from the technology that I just described, mm -hmm. just like CAR T cell therapy. What you do is you, you. So my my actually my other research is about immunotherapy or in autoimmune disease, not, not in cancer. Mm -hmm. So what you do, you, you take the dendritic cell and, and then you give them antigen, then they can present the antigen. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when you put them back, the T cell will recognize it, mm -hmm. right? So it means you are stimulating the, the cellular response. You're not, you know, you're, you're hoping you're gonna stimulate the, later you're gonna stimulate the, uh, humoral respond with the antibody. Okay. So it's a little bit different than, than, than regular vaccine that we have right now. Uh, but looking at the practicality, um, you know, I don't know if, if it can compete with the vaccine currently as for the price. So okay. that's just my opinion. I don't okay. yeah, as a scientist, you. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Prof. So, how is that, Prof? Why, yeah, yeah, thank you, Prof. Taruna. Uh, in addition, last time I, when I was back from uh, US, I was producing uh, monoclonal antibody again, Max One. Mm -hmm. uh, then my idea is to uh, reduce the tumor using the Max One monoclonal antibody. Yeah, but uh, at the end. Uh, I don't have a partner. Maybe if I know you before, yeah. I will <laughs> produce a drug for the uh, anti tumor with uh, my Mac one. Uh, sure. Yeah. 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 yeah I, okay. I work right currently. I work with a, a company. I won't name the name. Uh, mm -hmm. They they are working. They they can produce antibody. They give me a lots of mm -hmm. antibody to study. But mm -hmm. their interest is is how can we solve brain diseases because antibody can't get into the brain and we are trying to help them because we have a way to deliver them to the brain. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, but don't give up. I mean, if you can produce antibody, <laughs> that's another area. Maybe you can collaborate with somebody who has a natural product, unique, unique natural product. You can generate your own uh, anti-cancer drug, you know, more selective. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you have to look at different things, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, Okay, yeah. one, one more question. May I just a small question regarding the yeah, sure. uh, autoimmune disease? A <laughs> friend of mine has already, uh, two of friend of mine have uh, children with the uh, autoimmune disease, but mm -hmm. now still the problem with the medication. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there already a drug for that in US? Well, depending on what because what, we don't have yeah. what what kind of autoimmune diseases do you have? Uh, if it's lupus, yeah. it's, it's very difficult. Mm. But, yeah, lupus, lupus. Yeah, lupus is is very difficult because the immune cell targets so many organs, mm. and and not many people uh, able. To, well, normally the treatment is is pretty severe. Means you suppress your immune system too low, and then the patient will be 
risk of infection because the immune system is low. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because they attack so many organs. Mm. Uh, for MS, for example, it's well studied. They are attacking the myelin sheath and the sequence that they are really recognizing is already identified. In fact, that sequence is the one that we use in the conjugate. Our conjugate mm. is well studied. So, yeah. so MS, type 1 diabetes, people can't handle them. Uh, arthritis, especially too yeah. now. Uh, there are many drugs that's, you know, solving them. Antibodies, in fact, mm. including. Mm. Uh, but but the lupus is a very difficult disease. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rob yeah. Taruna. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Nice. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Prof. Ayan, for the question, and then also Prof. Taruna for the answer. Uh, unfortunately, we are run off time. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, so for those uh, that uh, still have a question, so maybe later uh, you can still put it in the pigeonhole, and then we may deliver it to Prof. Taruna, and then maybe yes. you, will, you can answer it in, write, in written, yeah? Yeah, okay. uh, the other thing is, I, you know, you can contact me. I have... Ah, sure, um, yeah. Yeah, my email is easy, my last name, S-I-A-H-A-A-N, as long as you put two A at the end, Siahaan. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then at ku.edu, that's very simple. Okay, yes, thank you very much. So everyone should uh, write it down and then... Uh, I'm really uh, thanks that uh, I believe that all of us is already uh, learned a lot yeah, for the, the advancement and the, yeah, the cutting is of destructive uh, discovery from the yeah. small molecules and then we go to the peptide and then peptide mimetic and even then it's to the ATC, yeah, which is really... Yeah. I, actually, I never heard that someone in Indonesia is working with the ATC now. <laughs> no, that's very new. Yeah, it's very new one. So thank you very much, for Prof. Taruna, for the insight, uh, the very excellent lectures. And uh, thank you. Uh, we will, uh, I think, this uh, from this, uh, I will end the session today uh, for this uh, session. So thank you. And um, maybe... Uh, any um, from any uh, any comment from the other? I think it's true, yeah. Okay, so thank you, Prof. Runa, for all, and then we will go to the next session. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, let's we go to the next session. Uh, we are from the health, uh, yeah, we will go also still, the, the topic it's about uh, health, but then it's not really in human, but it's also very in, uh, important and interesting. We will go to uh, plant, yeah. So the next speaker uh, we have is Prof. Dr. Siti Subandia. It's our, our uh, Head of Center for Biotechnology Studies uh, in UGM. And Prof. Dia, are you already here? <laughs> Hello, Prof. Dia. Wait a minute. Is she here? Prof. Dia. Hello. Assalamualaikum. Hello, Prof. Dia. Where are you? <laughs> Wait a minute. So uh, let's us make sure first that Prof. Dia is ready already for the uh, lectures. We, um, yeah. Prof. Dia actually she's been here in this morning, but when I'm looking for in the participant list, it's she's she's not here, and she just texts me that she has a connection problem there. Mm, and okay. Yeah, maybe she needs a little more time to fixing her connection problems. Maybe we can, uh, while waiting her finishing the problem, maybe some of us, if we have a question, we, maybe we can continue discussing with Prof. Teruna first. <laughs> Dr. Teruna, yeah. <laughs> yeah, is Prof. Teruna still here, no? Yeah, ah, he yeah still she's here. still here. Okay, okay. So is there any uh, more question uh, to Prof. Teruna? So 
uh, for me, it's actually very new one, Prof. So uh, I have a question. So actually, if you when you do the ADC, when you choose the ADC, so it's antibody. So. Uh, Ah, okay. Good day. Is there already? So later, <laughs> I will just no problem. Okay. I will just later. Uh, uh, no, ah, no, no, no. It's okay it's because we we already run off time. Later, I will just maybe email to Prof. Teruna my hmm. uh, my question. Hmm. It's okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Prof. Dia, um, it's, it's great that uh, to have you here. Uh, maybe we will. Uh, we can. Uh, okay, Mbak Putu. Yeah. We can see first. I will just like to uh, read first your CV. Uh, Prof. Dia is the head of Center for Biotechnology Study Program in Indonesia in UKM, and then uh, she's a professor in plant pathologies at the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology uh, Gajah Mada University since 2007. And uh, currently, she is also serving as director of Research Center for Biotechnology since 2015. Since 2020, yeah, she is also the principal investigator of research collaboration project on MAMRA, monitoring antimicrobial resistance in agriculture ecosystem under CIAU GFS, and also uh, she also conduct, uh, managing uh, several international research collaboration now uh, in plant protection under ASIAR, yeah? BM Gates Foundation, now SPIN and SIRAT and, and also GSPS as the project leader at UKM. So with his with her uh, experience and this uh, expertise, I'm sure that uh, we will have a a really interesting lecture uh, from Prof. Dia. Yeah? Uh, Prof. Dia, you will have 14 minutes to talk, yeah? and then we will continue with 15 minutes for discussion. So without uh, waiting a lot of time, so let's go. Uh, Prof. Dia, time is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, sama -sama, uh, Ibu. Thank you very much to share our uh, experience dealing with the biotechnology in our Kajah Muda University. Uh, of course, it is uh, very different from uh, Kansas University, so that's why we are trying to have a collaboration with uh, Professor Taruno and his uh, department to or also, hopefully, also in the pathology department or plant protection department uh, yeah. at Kansas mm -hmm. University. So, uh, here in, in a Gajah Mada, or generally in Indonesia, the uh, facilities for working in biotechnology is uh, still uh, limited. Uh, so we have to have uh, support from our counterpart outside there in developed countries. So that's why, as uh, introduced by Ibu uh, especially for my field, plant protection, we have done some collaboration, sending our students uh, to uh, to do some research uh, related to biotechnology or molecular biology outside that. That's because in our uh, uh, institute uh, the facilities is still very limited. Okay, thank you. This this time I would like to share in general actually uh, under the title of the role of biotechnology for global food security. That's uh, from. Uh, one head again for me. So the outline of uh, my talk may be uh, including the introduction of the field, then uh, go to the security, and then go to food production, maybe, of course, starting with the population rate, and uh, how agricultural biotechnology can contribute um, <coughs> gaining the security, and maybe just a little bit of conclusion. So, since this uh, event is uh, organized by One Health uh, Collaborative Center at Gajah Mada, actually, so it's the uh, <coughs> no for this One Health. It is the concept that the health of humans, animals, and the environment, and in here, in the environment, is including food crops because this is my field, and I uh, uh, link it and integrate it strongly. So.
that's why one help contributes in getting food safety, food security, and sustainability of food production globally. Uh, I pick up the uh, presentation of Dr. Garcia, uh, Garcia, the role of one help. Uh, uh, to connect scientists, uh, policy makers, and the public in dialogue in order to realize meaningful change in agricultural practices and policies uh, for the benefit of society. Uh, of course, this, this time is uh, to gain the food security in <coughs> uh, our nation. Yeah. So what is food security is? Food security means that all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their food uh, preference and dietary needs for an active and healthy life. So here, yeah, food security is necessary for every individual at home, in the community, and in the nation. So that's why uh, it is really important uh, during this pandemic, uh, we can uh, read from the news or the paper that uh, food production or agriculture is the one which is uh, uh, less uh, affected by the pandemic. So, uh, it is good, uh, uh, good news that the agriculture or food production can be uh, strengthened. Yeah. Although in the uh, disaster like this COVID pandemic. And of course, uh, food is very important for everyone. Uh, so it is through the agriculture, uh, food production may <coughs> contribute by any way in uh, uh, contributing the, in the survival or uh, improvement of this uh, nation together globally. So the global food production uh, uh, is uh, the population that we already know from uh, several years ago yeah, that the uh, UN uh, said that the world's population is expected to grow to 9.7 billion in 2050, while the uh, maybe. Uh, further increase to 11.2 billion. Yeah. On the other hand, the food production is maybe not that uh, uh, good to catch, to feed the whole population because of that population, uh, especially even in developing countries, it is made more difficult yeah, to eradicate the poverty and ensure food security. Yeah. So with the presentation of poverty, you know, country, it is uh, related to how secure the food in that uh, country. So, uh, in Indonesia, I think we still have uh, more than 10% of poverty, uh, or maybe after the pandemic, it became more even increasing. Uh, sustainable agricultural production must be the basis to achieve food security yeah, and to reduce the malnutrition and the elevated uh, uh, poverty. More research in being dedicated to achieving global food security through a common practice yeah, is quite important. Yeah, if we uh, see or read some uh, information, it is uh, clearly that the uh, uh, population growth as the uh, uh, food production is like in, especially in developing countries. Yeah, uh, this, uh, not secure yeah, for the uh, for the uh, availability. So, uh, it is it, it needs to have a kind of uh, good concept how to gain the food security. If we hope properly, it's very uh, very challenging. Yeah? And for national also, uh, every country maybe with different uh, states of development uh, have a situation when you get to mention a part uh, dimension part of security uh, can be like this that we are uh, food safety availability uh, the, the food availability and the accessibility and the utilization yeah. in here we have uh, some uh, 
constraint for the loss of food and the waste uh, already available, but it is wasted because maybe distribution not so very good. Yeah? And maybe also it is already available, but the utilization is not maximum. So uh, this is the kind of uh, concept that uh, and the, at the level of uh, uh, national, of course, and then in the uh, home, at home, of course, and for, for individual, it has to be uh, is it, uh, concern yeah, for everybody. So in the short term, uh, to have food secure, yeah, stable, stable yeah, uh, to avoid the uh, vulnerability, and in the long term, of course, uh, we should uh, support the generation. And from generation to generation, we have a sustainability of environment, economic, and also culture. Uh, it's very very at all in 2015. So if we can uh, have a look to the biotechnology, uh, we can learn that biotechnology area is quite wide. At least in here, in this in this uh, picture, uh, for food security, even uh, the area may about thirty percent from coal. So it is very important here, yeah. and it is maybe also becoming, uh, I mean, increasing on the area that can be reached by biotechnology. Uh, however, we this time we we should uh, focus on the food security. Okay, uh, agriculture biotechnology is uh, used uh, as a new scientific technique on understanding of DNA through genetic engineering to improve to improve crops and livestock. So uh, not only food as a carbohydrate process, but also meat yeah, and so on for protein resources, and uh, which is not in, not possible uh, to be conducted through the traditional reading. Yeah. Uh, it needs something more sus uh, sustainability and also more, what is it, uh, uh, advanced. Yeah. Uh, genetic engineering of crop for improved agronomic and nutritional trade involves the introduction of a novel trade into a crop through the manipulation of its genetic material into the yield, the nutrient quality, and also pest and disease resistance. Of course, this one also a part of the uh, uh, improving the yield and also have to be environmental sustainability. Yeah. Uh, get the hand for animal, yeah. uh, transmit animal, something to improve growth efficient, disease resistant, better traction, and uh, also better performance. <coughs> so, uh, in this case, because my field is in agriculture with dealing with plants, so I try to minimize my talk on plant biotechnology. Yeah. So through plant biotechnology, we can increase the crop yield through introducing high yielding varieties resistant to biotic and abiotic stresses and also can be uh, used for reducing pest associated loss and increase the nutritional values of food, yeah, which is a very important factor, especially in the developing countries. Uh, many people still uh, got malnutrition, uh, and so on. So it is a uh, serious problem. So biotechnology ability to eliminate malnutrition and hunger through the production of resistant to pests and diseases. Yeah, this, this this problem actually also linked to the use of uh, uh, unhealthy chemicals like pesticides, yeah. and it is also already creating many problems, so that's why biotechnology may uh, contribute to reducing the use of pesticides which are uh, harmful for human health or the environment. And also to have a longer shelf life, yeah, in Indonesia we may have many fruits or, or vegetables uh, uh, harvested, but after that, because it is very uh, risk to be destroyed, to be damaged by any other organism, then it is used to become best. Yeah. So it is how biotechnology may improve the longer self of life of the uh, product. Also refining the texture and the flavors, uh, higher yield per unit of land and time, yeah, 
uh, like uh, rice, uh, maybe can be improved until more than 10 ton per hectare, something like that. And uh, the uh, what's it? The period uh, now it is usually about 100 something days to get the product from rice. But maybe if we can shorter uh, the life cycle of the plant to get the, the product, it will uh, uh, more efficient yeah? on the input and also on the time yes, during the production. Also, uh, the issue of uh, climate change, pollution, and so on. So, uh, how biotechnology will be to adverse weather and also soil condition and temperature employment when we have a, a, a such technology applied here. So this technology can be applied to improve agriculture in order to improve food production for the human population in an environmentally sustainable manner. Uh, biotechnology manipulates the genetic makeup of organism for use in the production and processing of agricultural products through the sequencing of food crop a number of important genes were identified and the uh, method for shortening the cycle of the of, uh, food production and also food, food processing is becoming uh, more important and important. Yeah. And uh, it identified of the micro RNA, the use of micro RNA including like a MIR172 that can uh, uh, it, uh, regulate the expression of protein, protein gene for the improving in flowering time. When we can uh, eliminate this uh, uh, negative regulation, then we can have a uh, plant uh, flowering uh, earlier to get more efficient in the period of production of the food. So also uh, related then. Uh, uh, Biotechnology also can improve food security by increasing the nutritional value by the uh, production of the variety with uh, uh, more or rich of uh, pro vitamin A or zinc, uh, iron, and many other vitamins. Yeah? So it will improve the uh, value of the food, not only the quantity but also the quality. So uh, this is also. Uh, targeting to perform well under low input and stress condition and use the ergonomic input very judiciously uh, and also because uh, we have already too many uh, chemicals applied in the agriculture including pesticides and also synthetic uh, uh, fertilizer yeah. in here we, we may engage with the farmers uh, uh, analyzing their needs and adapting new varieties and agronomic practices to their own condition. And although, of course, in this case, biotechnology still needs a, a kind of a company with, a, with their a patent and so on. But uh, if we can uh, have a good, uh, better technology for the farmer to be uh, more uh, what is it? easily to use the biotechnology product that maybe uh, will improve food security. Yeah, in the agricultural biotechnology, uh, like we have uh, heard how, how to produce a GMO of plant yeah, uh, through the transfer of gene, yeah, uh, so that we can have uh, resistant varieties of plant that can produce a better product yeah, uh, without applying any or less uh, application of pesticide. Uh, Besides the transfer gene, uh, now we know already the uh, gene editing and also the use of uh, uh, RNA-based, uh, micro-RNA-based biopesticides that it is more uh, sustainable and friendly uh, compared to the use of pesticides. At the animal side, biotechnology uh, is able to improve uh, uh, the food for protein source, yeah, through the transient animal, genome transplantation, uh, embryo transfer, uh, producing the 
vaksin ya itu sebenarnya vaksin nah, pintar enter in, into Indonesia ya many vaksin for any more uh, produce through biotechnology and uh, distributed commercialized in Indonesia oke okay. uh, tugas of plant biotechnology it is quite complicated but actually this is uh, when we understand Uh, the, uh, the link yeah, from plant biotechnology through the uh, genome molecular fitting or genome editing, uh, transient crop or molecular farming and so on. Here we can reach the, uh, uh, the, the, the to gain the uh, elimination for hunger, elimination of malnutrition, of course improving human health and also improving the Yeah. Is, uh, but of course, in this uh, uh, picture, we we understand that uh, we cannot work alone. We have to work with many other uh, disciplines to gain the task, uh, to gain the the, the goal, yeah, to get the food security, food safety, and so on. Yeah. yeah, we also understand how the gene revolution started in 1900s. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, Mendel World Genetics yeah, up to uh, the successful of uh, human genome project and uh, the human genome project technology then uh, applicable for all other organisms including plants and animals uh, for food production. Yeah, we have uh, uh, understand how genetic modified uh, crops yeah, Uh, have been uh, produced and commercialized, but on the other hand, uh, there are of course uh, some opponent that uh, that's, that's also good. The opponent uh, will make us to improve our technology to be uh, better and more sustainable for the environment and human health. In here, I would like to focus more on the importance of biotechnology for plant protection yeah? because uh, uh, during the production food production through the agriculture uh, yeah, loss by pest and diseases is quite high uh, it is reported globally about more than 40 percent yeah, worldwide and uh, this is consisting uh, uh, pest uh, diseases and also wheat yeah? And for the diseases, uh, it is uh, at least 12% percent yeah, cause the uh, damage of the plant yeah, or the production becoming uh, decrease. So in here, the crop loss by pest and pathogen, yeah, insect, uh, uh, pest, yeah, insect pest, yeah, it is also quite high, and also diseases it is even higher. Yeah. The higher is diseases and also with. Uh, this uh, uh, problem here uh, can cause uh, more than 42% percent of a uh, uh, crop loss. Yeah. And in the plant pathogen, because I am an pathologist, so uh, here also consisting of viruses, uh, bacteria, nematode, and also fungi uh, infecting the plants to reduce uh, the production. Okay, the, uh, the technique applied in the in genetic modification include mutation breeding, improved conventional breeding, transgenic modification, and then insertion, gene transferring, and so on. Okay. Uh, hybridization. So, by technology in developing improved quality and functional food for human nutrition and health, is so possible, and by technology and genetic modification technique have been proposed and applied for the improvement of the quality and quality. Various food products. So, biotechnology uh, not only for uh, improving the uh, quantity, but also the quality uh, related to the functional food. Yeah. Yeah, we can see this. This, uh, this is an example of bacterial disease of rice. Yeah, rice is very important for us in Indonesia. Unfortunately, this disease is already more than 100 years uh, it was recognized but uh, until now it is still main problem for rice yeah? uh, 
PLP, factor of light of Christ. Uh, something like this, even it is uh, when we severe, uh, the production of course uh, quite low. Yeah. Uh, more than 40% can loss of Okay, pests and diseases are the main constraint on agricultural production. For plant protection patterns, we work on the identification of pests and pathogen yeah, uh, and plant disease diagnosis. Yeah, like uh, uh, the last disease, uh, it, it, it was uh, recognized or identified even until sub subspecies the, the pathogen. Uh, like Santomonas orisi, Patofa orisi, and in that case, we still have uh, uh, the group of the uh, XOO. Yeah, it is sub sub. It is uh, only can be identified through the molecular identification. It's uh, studied in the biotechnology and plant protection. And also, by biotechnology and study, we can understand more detail on the past and pathogen cause interaction so that. Uh, we may decide which way to stop uh, the interaction between the pathogen and uh, the host plant really to stop the disease. Yeah. And also the spread of the disease uh, in the population it is called as epidemiology. It is actually also epidemiology is actually for uh, for men, woman, human, yeah. But for plants should be happy people. Looking, yeah. Also, it is uh, we we also use epidemiology in the plant disease system, and biotechnology also involve involve a lot on the uh, pest and the disease control. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we we, uh, we have been doing an investigation to the gene yeah, and, uh, related to the resistant and also no. Uh, with the uh, genome editing, we also uh, uh, try to understand which one is the susceptibility gene. And then we can edit that gene so that uh, the plant becomes uh, immune. Uh, so we don't have to have rule. So we don't have to transfer the resistant gene to our crop, but maybe when we, our, our plant is uh, uh, susceptible, then how to edit that susceptible gene to be immune. So uh, that's uh, only recently yeah, uh, recognized, uh, uh, studied through the genome editing. And also here, uh, micro RNA or MIRNA, very nice uh, name, yeah, also already uh, developed to produce a biopesticide, which is uh, uh, because it is uh, quite specific to a certain gene of a certain interaction of the pathogen and the plants or insect and the host plant. So it's becoming more uh, friendly yeah, to the environment and the human health rather than using uh, the available pesticide now. Okay, this is also uh, what is it? The uh, plant genetic transformation. Yeah approaching that uh, to stop the disease by transferring a resistant gene from any other organism into the plant so that the plant can be uh, producing uh, more product yeah, because uh, escape from uh, the disease. Uh, the gene can be selected from any other organism including bacteria, even uh, mammalia, even uh, anything else, yeah. and then uh, through the study on the agrobacterium, something like that, it was it is also plant pathogen, yeah, but uh, already studied, become uh, useful for producing uh, GMO. Yeah. This yeah. creating a transgenic crop, which is uh, main resistant or even other uh, purposes, not only resistant to plant diseases, but also quality of the product and through the uh, DNA of a uh, group bacterium. Yeah. Okay, and also genome editing that's also uh, already uh, developed. Yeah. yeah, not only 
gene transfer ya. and this is one uh, RNA ini yang itu dia for uh, controlling pest and also disease ya. through the uh, regulation of the expression of the gene involved in the interaction between the pathogen or the host uh, and also the pest of the host ya. okay on the molecular identification and Uh, detection tool for pest and pathogen. Uh, this is a, can be partial or whole genome sequencing of the pest or pathogen, and then uh, from identified genes or uh, DNA, then we can use it to develop the tool to detect even uh, early detection uh, on the existence of the pathogen in the plant or in the environment, so that we can uh, stop the spread. Of infection earlier, so using the molecular identification, we can uh, use the tool uh, to identify in very uh, small or sub species. Yeah, uh, because usually the uh, problem of a pandemic it is actually caused by a certain strain, yeah, which is uh, only can be recognized through the molecular. Yeah? Not only by the, uh, the symptom, the symptom may be still the same, yeah. uh, uh, but uh, through the molecular, we can understand more. Or oh, this is the strain or uh, the group of the pathogen that can uh, survive or uh, virulence more to the, the plants. Yes, so that the production increase very sharply. Yeah. Uh, such a molecular detection tool also have been developed to be rapid, practical, and of course accurate, yeah? and even real time, yeah? so that uh, we can stop the spread of the, of the pathogen or the infection or the uh, disease in the population earlier. Something like this uh, used to be only morphologically identification, yeah? and then followed by biochemist or physiologist, but to isolate the pathogen, separate it from any other organism which are secondary or uh, saprophytic, and we have to do this kind of work in the laboratory, you know, yeah. but now even we can do the uh, uh, sequencing partially or even next generation sequencing to understand more detail on the uh, pathogen causing the disease, so we can uh, pick up or uh, choose the strategy how to uh, manage the pathogen. Yeah, and uh, uh, from the molecular studies, then we can uh, develop a kind of tool, yeah, and also here from PCR and even now uh, using the biosensor based on the uh, expression of kind of gene yeah, uh, to be more practical and still accurate, yeah, but also affordable yeah, by the farmer to understand what happened in their field when sometimes they got problem yeah, in the food production. Yeah. Also on the pet and pathogen host interaction, yeah, uh, we need to know uh, more detail how the pathogen or the pest are causing damage or disease on the plants and then how can we have a Uh, we, we can stop yeah, the infection or the spread of the disease. Yeah. See, like the, in here, the pathogen host plant interaction. So this is in the Agrobacterium tumorphosium, which is called the crown gall on the plants. Uh, then the plant will uh, dying or uh, stunting. Yeah. But through the molecular identification, then even we Uh, understand how plants uh, genetic colonization genetic colonize the host plant and now we use the uh, mechanism to transfer genes uh, from uh, other sources uh, integrated into the pathogen but of course already constructed uh, for transferring uh, the gene that we would like to transfer to the plant yeah? Sorry, Prof. Yeah, you have five minutes more. Okay, and this is more detail, yeah, to the molecular studies. And 
of course on the molecular epidemiology using the molecular tools we can uh, understand uh, faster and accurately how the pathogen or the disease spread in the population again and of course the control or the uh, diseases and pests we, 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 we may develop many uh, techniques uh, from transferring the gene or gene editing and to have a, a transgenic or edited plants yeah, which is uh, more uh, is it, uh, healthier, he healthier to produce the food yeah. you can see this uh, difference between the transgenic and the non-transgenic here as well yeah, so uh, the use of high yielding disease and pest resistant crop will have a direct bearing on improved uh, food security. And also, GM crop will hopefully produce more yield and less land. Yeah? Okay, maybe uh, the potential use of modern veterinary gene agriculture include increasing yield while reducing input, which is uh, already going to the conclusion. Yeah? And fertilizer and so on. Yeah. Uh, Crop veterinary is reduced pesticide use, yeah, that's it, by almost 550 million kilograms, yeah, and from 1997 to 2017, how much they already contribute, yeah, uh, in the food production, yeah, okay, so, uh, successful strategies should have multiple approaches that address principal factor in food. Fiber and fuel, yeah. This is the progress of uh, uh, rice production, yeah, increasing yeah, through the biotechnology, and also many countries also already accommodated that technology. Yeah, where yeah, we can see here um, in the floating country, uh, country and the global, uh, the global in 2018 by the crop already occupied that much. Yeah. And here also, uh, this is you can see the soil production as well. Yeah? It is improving through the GMO. Yeah. So, as the reason, this focus in molecular biology and biotechnology creates hope for the future to increase the quantity and quality of food production. And with the help of genetic engineering technique, scientists continue to improve crops in an effort to dismiss losses caused by, caused by biotic and biotic. Okay, thank you for the attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Ria, for the uh, comprehensive uh, lectures and also uh, giving us uh, more uh, insight about how the biotechnology can uh, support the food uh, security yeah, uh, for Indonesia. So I will open uh, for the question and answer. Is there any question already for Prof. Dia? Yeah. First, uh, okay, so we will see here. Okay. From uh, so Miss Sophia Anika, yeah. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the insightful knowledge. Do you have any advice on where should students start research to help the food security in Indonesia? They are the area of research or species that most important now. So maybe you can give yeah. Uh, maybe you can give the. Uh, idea to this uh, maybe yeah. I think it's just new student mm -hmm. high technology yeah. okay okay thank you Sophia really nice question okay how and where we can start uh, in the beginning I have uh, told us the our facilities for doing biotechnology in Indonesia is still limited however biotechnology is not only modern biotechnology we also have done a long time uh, using a, a traditional biotechnology. So what we can do is while we start with improving the traditional one, but while waiting for the availability of the facilities for modern biotechnology. Yes, we can do some modern biotechnology, uh, like uh, uh, using molecular uh, detection tool to identify any genes or any, uh, okay, uh, uh, better gene or good gene for improving the uh, food production yeah? and also to suppress uh, pests and diseases. 
then we also can do it. And so far, while we don't have enough uh, facilities, uh, since we can uh, have collaboration with our counterpart there, and also due to the uh, commercial technology, like we, if we don't have any uh, DNA, sequen DNA sequencer to know to identify our gene, then we can send it. It's something like that. So we just do whatever we can uh, do with limited <coughs> facilities here. Uh, we can start from the food crop. We have been doing a lot with the rice, uh, <coughs> rice or uh, what is it, uh, mice. Yeah. But actually, we also have many other crops which is actually more valuable, like horticultural crop. When we produce a good uh, horticulture crop, we can uh, send the product and buy the food crop, something like that. Then, uh, <clears throat> we, we can decide which, which one is more profitable, and then we can start to do that work on the communities. I think, is that answering your question? Okay, thank you, Prof. Yeah, so how is that, um, Sophia? Uh, Okay, it's okay. It's already great. Okay, so maybe we can go to the next question, but but Babutu, yeah. Uh, okay, here this is from Babutu. So the question is, what about the use antibiotic in Indonesia's agriculture nowadays? Is it common and legal? Uh, mm. city? Yeah. <clears throat> well, antibiotic is not uh, not cheap. Yeah, it is quite. Uh, Expensive, yeah. No. However, yeah, maybe some <clears throat> antibiotic like uh, tetracycline or penicillin, which are more uh, <coughs> cheaper, yeah, maybe only used by our farmers, especially in the animal husbandry, yeah. Mm. And in a, in a, in the farm, maybe not on the food crop, yeah, but maybe on the horticultural crop, which is uh, more valuable, yeah. Uh, even sometimes to have that uh, long life uh, performance of the fruit or or uh, vegetable, they may spray some antibiotic. It is, of course, it is not good. Yeah, whether it is legal or not. Yeah, of course, there is uh, some rules to use antibiotic, but uh, uh, the monitoring is still uh, not very. Not very tough, yeah. Not very, not very tough, yeah. Strict, yeah. Why, yeah, not very strict. So, and uh, it seems that see, like the use of thorax or the use of uh, something else in the food, it is already rule uh, to use it uh, with very limited uh, application. But of course, we still can find that uh, such a uh, uh, chemical in the, in the food. Yeah. Well, we have to uh, teach our public also yeah like uh, uh, like uh, on on chili yeah chili when it is a very high price even farmer applied so many uh, so many pesticide even systemic one which is inside into the fruits that cannot be uh, what is it cannot be drained or washed yeah because it is inside in the in the uh, <laughs> it yes. is. It is happened. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Prof. Yeah. So, we are, we, do we still have questions, uh, right here, Apoto? Okay. Still one more from. Okay. No, I don't know who's this. Okay. How about uh, thrombocytopenia? Can Okay, this is for Prof. Taruna, sorry. Okay, so later we will just uh, give it to Prof. Taruna, sending it to him. Okay, so is there still any question from the audience uh, for Prof. Siti? It's all done, uh, Dr. Nuning. Okay, so maybe I have one question, Prof. Siti. Okay. <laughs> As, um, we know that uh, in the we we a lot of uh, one of your in your lecture you mentioned about the uh, GM crop yeah so this is one of the maybe actually good approach for the security but um, 
I know that up to now there are still a lot of uh, contra about this application, mm -hmm. and so what uh, in in your uh, what do you think? Uh, is there any what is the strategy strategy yeah, using the most suitable? Uh, for Indonesia now, especially for the application of biotechnology to support the food security. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like we know, we believe actually uh, crop is also quite straightforward, but the problem is, yeah, there's, there's uh, acceptance is not really good, yeah? So what do you think? Uh, is there still any other strategies for, or which one which is more suitable for us? Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, uh, on the GM crops and also edited crops, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in Indonesia, a GM crop already have the rule. Uh, mm. It has, it, it can be uh, commercialized and planted in, in mm -hmm. Indonesia after uh, getting the permission from the biosecurity board. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, but until now, it is still very limited. Even the one mm. produced by our uh, <coughs> college in Indonesia, it is still okay. not really produced in the field. Yeah, mm. yeah, because uh, uh, the 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 rules is quite tough and complicated. Yeah? Even maybe longer uh, compared to how to develop the GMO. Yeah? But actually, yeah. we have consume a lot of GMO mm, products. Yeah? So the uh, the permission to for entering, I mean for importing GMO product like uh, OED, uh, like uh, soybean, it is the soybean is, is actually the soybean grain, yeah, or uh, any other food, yeah. Uh, it is uh, probably and it is already produced through the GMO outside there, mm. but we can accept it as long as it is past the food uh, security, uh, sorry, food safety uh, commission, yeah, something like that. So, mm, uh, okay. Yeah, so it, we have become, become a consumer then. Yeah, okay. actually we already yeah. consume a lot, yeah. yeah. But people mm -hmm. then still thinking of those, uh, uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. there is still one question here uh, that raised from Pak Bagus, but it's directly mm -hmm. sent to me. I will just read it for you, Prof. Siti. Uh, Prof. Siti, uh, uh, how to manage the pests to grow crops in ecological agricultural way since there are organisms that benefit for crops and environment? Thank you. So it seems like how to manage this because we all, not all of the pet, uh, insect or maybe it's, it's bad. So some is good, some is not. So how you will manage that uh, yeah, in the, yeah. the agriculture? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Instead of genetic engineering, yeah. we may do some ecological engineering. Yeah, including okay. the microbial community uh, mm. engineering. Yeah, uh, okay. the the composition of the microbes that uh, support mm -hmm. the growth of the plant but suppress pests and diseases. Yeah, we can use also multi genomic, uh, uh, sorry, meta genomic analysis for the yeah. environment. Yeah, uh, we still can use mm. biotechnology, molecular biology, uh, to understand uh, what kind of community that uh, beneficial for the plants, but not for uh, the pests and diseases. Yeah. It is, uh, yeah, it is, can be done, yeah, can be done, yeah. But of course, the, okay. the kits, the, uh, the tools, we, we still have to, to import the, yeah, the, the, the facilities, yeah, to, to okay. do the such work. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prof. Dia. How is that, Pak Bagus? That already answered your question. Okay, he said yes. Okay, so then um, we still have one more uh, possible for one more question. Is there uh, any question from the audience? So I just want to have one more um, comment from Prof. City. Yeah. As you, uh, you are now uh, become the research, uh, PI for the research uh, in MAMRA, yeah, monitoring antimicrobial resistance. So actually, how 
how bad it's that the the, the resistance of uh, the yeah antimicrobial resistance in plants in Indonesia. Can you give us more insight about this? Yeah, how about how how bad it's the actually the resistance maybe with the with those insecticide or yeah for the application of those insecticide to the to the pest in Indonesia. No, so it seems like of the is not. Is that? Wait a minute. Ah, yeah. Sorry, it's like uh, she Remember. got a problem. Yeah, she got a Remember. problem with the signal. <laughs> <laughs> Mohon maaf, ini sepertinya Prof dia uh, ada problem dengan signal di uh, di rumah ya. Yeah. Maybe we will can we can wait a bit for a while ya yeah, sebelum uh, kita selesaikan. Mbak Putu ada ada kabar dari Prof dia? Uh, belum Ibu. Ini baru saya tanyakan lagi apakah sinyalnya menghilang lagi. <laughs> Yeah, is it possible for her to to join or not? Yeah. Yes. So I just want to maybe to give uh, also uh, information for the for the audience that maybe in the middle of September, yeah, Pak, yeah, Prof. Ayan, yeah. there will yeah. be another uh, series uh, lecture. Maybe you mm -hmm. can give some uh, information about this, Prof. Ayan. Uh, who will me talk in that uh, say, in that time? So maybe the audience also can start to to, to put it in their schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the two speakers, is, uh, one speaker from Thailand, mm, from okay. uh, uh, from Chilalangkon mm -hmm. uh, on zoonotic disease ah, in okay. uh, fish zoonotic diseases, and then myself from One Health. Okay. Yeah, in connection to biotechnology. Mm. It's very uh, interesting as well because now the zoonotic disease is also become very uh, it's it's uh, become more attention on this yeah because of a lot of disease is now seems like transferring from <laughs> uh, 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 fat yeah and from animal to human animal to human yeah so it's I think the study for this it should be also become more more and more important yeah. Um, how is that? <laughs> let's let's yeah. let me check. Uh, yeah, she's still loading, still oh. in the processing because maybe the yeah the signals against. Okay, so for the uh, just also to want to remind to remind for the participant who need the a certificate, yeah. So please uh, fill the attendance uh, form, yeah, uh, already in the chat room there. Uh, so don't forget to to fill it in so then around a week we will send this e certificate together maybe with the um, material from the from the speakers yeah um Ning, uh, I, I just chat with her about your question regarding about the antimicrobial resistance and she asked me you can answer it <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> so that's good. No problem. So it's also a good discussion, yeah, for all. So because I, uh, uh, for your information, uh, Butu is also the student of Prof City, which working with this, yeah. So yes. maybe you can give me uh, uh, you answer that because I, I really don't know. So that's why I asked this question because I I don't know about this, yeah. Actually, I was keeping in my mind, please, Prof. Dia, don't ask me to answer, but <laughs> she gone and she just texted me to answer. So I will try to answer it um, about the, the project of the antimicrobial resistance in agriculture or mm -hmm. agro environment. Actually, we have, uh, we have done several preliminary study. Mm -hmm. We did a collection uh, for the manure from cattle and then Coat and then uh, chicken uh, that grow in Piat, the uh, agriculture technology center of Universitas Gajah Mada, yeah. and we collect several uh, soil that uh, the land was used to grow the chili and um, padi. 
Okay. And we did a qPCR array, mm -hmm. and we found uh, several antibiotic resistant genes. Not several; it's a lot actually. Wow. And um, yeah, but, uh, actually, our our main project, uh, the the purpose of our main project is we would like to monitoring and to profiling what kind of antimicrobial resistant gene uh, persists in the Indonesian agriculture yeah, soil. Yeah. Why? Because we know that most of the farmer in Indonesia, they use uh, animal manure, they use the livestock manure. And yeah. we know that uh, I, me as the veterinarian, that we know very well, no animals that no have a disease, don't have a disease. So they have yeah. must to have a disease, which is uh, sometimes uh, they, uh, they are sick and get drugs uh, from antibiotics mm -hmm. and you know several uh, in the poultry and other livestock industry they use a lot of antibiotics there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just a few of antibiotic can be absorbed in the body of the animal mm -hmm. and most of them are throwing out to the environment through the feces and this feces as used uh, is used uh, by the farmer as the manure and apply it in the soil, which is bring those antimicrobial resistance bacteria and the antimicrobial resistant gene from the farmer, from the farm to the environment. And that is our concern. How, how, um, how, how can I say, how dangerous are we now? Because we, uh, up to now, there is no any study about it in Indonesia. And mm -hmm. most of study, already done in China, in Europe, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure in the USA, and they have several work in Australia, which is, they are, most of them are four seasons country, different with us, which is we only have two season, uh, season and most, uh, we, we are doing the, the planting all of the year, which is the soil can be a good resource for those antimicrobial resistant genes, and then, that's what we are doing now. And from uh, the samples that we already collected from Piat, from Universitas Gajah Mada, we found that there are a lot of resistant genes that are uh, responsible to beta-lactam. And most of them are aminoglycoside. And then, um, yes, beta-lactam, which is uh, the most antibiotic used in the agriculture, uh, in the, uh, yes, in the livestock. And more surprisingly, that we, we can found carbapenem, mm -hmm. antimicrobial resistant genes. Yes, the carbapenem, which is, this is the last antibiotic used in, uh, in, in the human. If we have the resistance against this antibiotic, maybe we have no any idea what kind of the drugs that can uh, heal us. And uh, carbapenem have four class, A, B, C, and D. And the uh, chickens, manure contains all of the class. Uh, actually, the use of this antibiotic, uh, uh, this antibiotic uh, isn't used in animal, but why this uh, gene can appear in the, in the manure and also we found in the soil as well. Um, there is a theory that uh, it can, it's not a theory, it's, uh, there are already several studies that antimicrobial resistant gene is not only come from animal, but also come from human. Since the uh, the farm in and also in the soil, there are a lot of humans activity there. It can be come from them, maybe from their body. They uh, they excrete, and then goes to the farm, goes to the soil. That's why we can found it. It, it can be like that, but uh, we still don't know up to now. And uh, that is the the reasons uh, the reasons finding of our study. Mm. And currently. Uh, we are doing uh, to collect the samples from uh, six cities in Java. Uh, we, we did two cities in East Java, Nanjo and, Nanjo and Batu. Mm -hmm. That's the letter of the research permission I already sent to the Pusti. Yeah, <laughs> and I hope yeah. I get your signature. And then, really <laughs> and then uh, we will have in the, in the central Java, we will put to the bus and mm -hmm. Dieng, uh, because we're focusing on shallots and uh, potato, shallots, okay. chili, um, paddy, and potato, which most of them, uh, according to Prof. City, uh, she said that 
uh, in in shallots, uh, the the farmer use a lot of antimicrobial action. Actually, not antibiotic, but also they use a lot of pesticides. Pesticides. Yeah, yeah. This can for sure it can impact the soil conditions. Okay. So we did in Jogja, also we do in uh, West Java, and I did the monitoring in each month in every uh, regions in Jogja. So we can see not only the abundance, but also the, the dynamic of the antimicrobial resistance in the soil. That's okay. my answer. Pravdia, what do you think? Can I pass this question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Maputo. And uh, Pravdia, you are still mute, no? Um, so, Thank you very much for this insight. So uh, I think yeah. it's really in important and very interesting. We may we may wait for the next uh, maybe for the next uh, topics. Yeah, we can also uh, uh, you uh, take this as one of our lecture series because this is also very important for all of us. Yeah, the prof, yeah. So is it fine now? Can you yeah. hear my? No, I use uh, my mobile phone. Than, uh, the laptop. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. In the village, so the, the, the signal of the IP is open. No problem, okay. yeah. Yeah, it's okay. So, as the, as there still any question from the audience uh, before we, we close for this uh, question and answer section? Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is very yes. interesting, very interesting, uh, Prof. Dia, because uh, I'm thinking about the development of uh, herbal medicine in which the active compound can be uh, increased by uh, biotechnology. Uh, I think in the uh, overseas uh, research already been done, there's a lot of this. Mm -hmm. because the in the uh, industry is a support of this research but uh, i think in indonesia is still uh, very seldom people doing this but at least if we can do this if we can make some kind of uh, 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 preliminary and also yes. uh, a published paper yeah. i mm -hmm. think it's very very good and select yes. the of the ag agriculture uh, uh, what is it? the herbal medicine that grows really fast, like we can harvest with three, four, five months. I think it's more than enough to identify the quality and also the quality of technique and biotechnology. That's what I think, Prof. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Yes. Uh, actually, we are number two in the biodiversity, right? So we have a lot of assets, uh, bio assets that can be used for uh, as herbal for uh, human disease cure, uh, also for agriculture. Many yeah. of the uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, bio fertilizer and also bio pesticides. Yeah, even from natural product, we have many kind of. Uh, yeah. So uh, we also push our farmer to find any uh, traditional. Pesticides, using, like using the extract of chili, even chili when it is not very valuable, you can uh, blend it and spread to your <laughs> farm uh, instead of yeah. using pesticides. Like yeah. That, yeah, and we have so many other things like uh, extract of the plants, extract yeah. of the seeds, like uh, yeah, that's, that's also very important. Yeah. 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 That kind of uh, work. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the detailed uh, study, we can uh, waiting for the uh, availability of the facilities, or actually we also can have collaboration with the twelve countries, scientists and the developers like Siahaan uh, and so our other colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I think Mbak Nuning did Mbak Nuning. This uh, did this uh, research uh, for a while about this quality of uh, developing herbal medicine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think okay, it will be very. You. Yeah, thank you very much for the discussion, Prof. Bagus and Prof. Siti. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we are.
uh, up to the end of the question and answer of this uh, session. And again, thank you for also th for the all of the audience who is uh, who are patiently um, uh, listening and also following this uh, discussion. So thank you, Prof. Ria, uh, for the insightful lectures. And then I will written it to the uh, master and Sir of ceremony, Mbak Putu, uh, time is yours, yeah. Thank you very much once again, Pununing, and also all of the speakers, Prof. Pia and also Prof. Taruna, which is already left the Zoom meeting. And um, before we close this session, I would like to invite all of the uh, participants to turn on the video because uh, we need to take a picture together, oh, <laughs> unfortunately, okay. without um, Prof. Taruna, but Actually, I, I did several times to take a picture uh, with, with him, a moment with him. So I will wait for others to prepare their video. Maybe for yeah, the moment yeah. they wear the hijab first. Oh, it's okay, I will see you <laughs> around two minutes. <laughs> yeah, normally sometimes. <laughs> it's happened to me also <laughs> when we are doing the webinar. I just turn on the video and take off my hijabs. And when all of the part, or when all of the um, committee asks to turn on the video, then just hurry up to wear it. Yeah, true. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's great. Okay, so we'll take. Yeah. The first screen is already turned on the video. Maybe I can take the picture first to the to, for those who already turned on the video in the first screen. I will count to three. One, two, and oh, wait a minute. There is still have a, one, two, and three. Once again, one, two, and three. Let's move to the second screen. You can keep smiling because you don't know where where are you are uh, where you are put on uh, in my screen one two and three on the third screen one two and three thank you very much thank for you. all of the participants once again please don't forget to turn to write down your attendance um, by filling the form that we already shared in the chat and we will send you the e-certificate and also the PowerPoint of the of the uh, presenter after we get the permission through your email around one week after this uh, lecture. And yeah. I would like also to say thank you very much for Profia and as our speakers today. And thank you, uh, Prof. Bagus. And, and, and Pak Indar. Pak Indar, yeah, I saw his yeah. picture there. <laughs> My lecture. And then I would like to say thank you also Putini and Bununing as the moderator today. Thank you very much, everyone. And this is the end of the session. I hope all of you have a nice day and be safe. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pak Bagus. Thank you. Bagus. Terima kasih, Pak Wayan, Budia, Mbak Muding, Mbak Kudu, Mbak Dini, semuanya yeah. salam sehat, ye. Yeah. Terima kasih, Pak Wayan. Terima kasih, Pak Wayan. Terima kasih, Pak Wayan. Terima kasih, Pak Wayan. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Mohon izin pamit, Pak Wayan. Yeah. Oh, ya, terima kasih. Thank you yeah, for Indohun. Ya, yeah, thank you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak alumni juga ini. Yeah. Terima kasih sekali sudah hadir. Yeah. Jangan lupa tanggal pertengahan September. Ya. Yeah. Yeah. Ada so, lagi. Impetition menyusul. Ya. Yeah. Yeah. Mohon izin pamit, Prof. Ya. Ya, sama-sama. Ya, terima kasih. Mari-mari, terima kasih. Monggo kununing kalau mau lanjutkan. Nggih, Mas Arun. Bareng-bareng. Nggih, monggo-monggo.